Okay. So this will be the lecture covering ableism and ageism. So very straightforward lecture. We're going to be talking about ableism as well as ageism. Um, also, we're going to be talking about even the rat was white. Chapter four um, is what I have on my agenda. So first, what I'll do is I'll talk about ableism in the first half. And so it'll be in this video. And then in the next video, I will talk about ageism. And then after that, I will talk about, um, I may combine the videos, um, even the rat was white. So before we get started with ableism, we have to discuss a couple terms first. Um, one important term is disability. So according to the American Disabilities Association, uh, or the American Disabilities Act, excuse me, um, a disability is any physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. So when we think about disabilities, this is a multifaceted, multidimensional construct, um, mainly because it doesn't just encompass um, one form of disability or one form of psychological disability. It includes multiple. Um, there are a lot of psychological disorders, for example, um, and they are not like each other. Same thing for physical disabilities. There are a lot of physical disabilities that are not like um, the other. So when you look at disabilities, it's a multifaceted and multidimensional um, construct. Uh, and because of how multidimensional it is, a lot of people um, within, the, within the globe live with a disability. Actually, ac according um, to your book, it mentions 15% of people in the world have a disability. So if you break that down, that's about 110 million and 140 million people within the globe. So that's quite a lot of people. And your book outlines that as the largest minority group. So people ask a lot of questions about um, disabilities being a form of identity. Now, I know what you're thinking. Um, or what other people have discussed uh, with a disability, it's not it's not associated with identity. That's not one of the things uh, things that we immediately think of whenever we talk about identities. However, with oppression um, and really with society, society places value in ideologies and assumptions based upon a person's um, experience, and in particular for this type of oppression that we're talking about, it's focusing on physical and mental ability status. So granted, initially, disability was not considered part of my identity. However, as we've identified the ways in which society um, limits people living with disabilities, it becomes an oppression. There's an experience of oppression there. So with ableism, it encompasses these different systems and exclusion um, of people living with disabilities. And it functions at the individual, the interpersonal and systemic levels. So think back to the socialization process. In the beginning, we learn um, about the ideologies, norms, assumptions associated with people living with disabilities. Um, our family members may pass on some messages that they have heard. Our peers may do the same thing. And then lastly, the system in which a person lives in, there are certain ideologies, norms that are portrayed or promoted um, about people living with disabilities. And at every level, these, these levels, um, there's a reinforcement. Um, each level reinforces each other. So when we look at ableism, um, really what we're gonna look at is in each different level. What we're gonna first start with is talking about systems. So this might be ed in education, services, and um, policies, so laws. And what we have found is that there have been a lot of barriers um, that reinforce ableism. So 
when we look at the American Disabilities Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act um, amendments, they've been passed and there are still some changes that need to be done. Um, it may not be fully inclusive of everyone with, um, uh, with certain physical or psychological disabilities. Another one, accommodations and accessibility. So when we think about higher education, right, think about universities. When it comes to the design of buildings of university, universities, they may not be fully accommodating and fully accept, uh, accessible to people living with physical disabilities, um, specifically disabilities that where um, they may not be able to walk upstairs. Uh, and when it comes to accommodations, it might be from um, the, uh, the testing office, um, people, not people, live, students living with disabilities may have to jump through hoops to get those accommodations. And granted, there are people living, uh, people within um, these offices that are doing the best that they can to make the accommodations possible. And it would be a lot easier if faculty were aware of their own responsibilities for students with disabilities. Um, so a lot of the times, faculties are completely unaware of the th activities, the things that they have to do to, um, uh, uh, responsibilities and things that they have to do when it comes to accommodations. Um, a lot of the times, it's placed upon the student. And the student has to go up to the instructor um, and make sure that they talk to them. And at the end of the day, it's a matter of, even if it might be a responsibility upon the faculty uh, member, students with this, students with certain disabilities or students with disabilities may experience that blame that they weren't able to do the best that they could to get the accommodation when it was on part of the responsibility of faculty. Students may not receive accommodations in a timely manner. Um, this is a big one. And mainly because when we, when we look at higher education, and I'll outline it a little bit more in the, um, later in the lecture, what we do know is that when students are fully engaged in their education, they're able to, um, they're able to thrive. And if students with living with disabilities are not able to get those accommodations, they're not able to um, fully engage in their academics. And that's kind of, not kind of, it is a problem. And then another one, and this is in part of higher ups, it's a perception that these accommodations and accessibility can be time consuming to make renovations to the university's buildings to accommodate um, students living with um, disabilities, uh, physical disabilities, these projects, they're considered projects and they take time. Um, and it may not be in time for the beginning of the quarter or the beginning of the semester. Another one, think about the structure of the university buildings. Um, when we have met, in class, we met at Woodard Hall, we met on the second floor. If you are familiar with Woodard Hall, and I believe most of you are, most of you listening to this lecture are psychology majors, have you stopped to notice that there are no elevators within Woodard Hall? Also, when it comes to accessibility for uh, to the building, while there, while you can find steps on at least two sides of the building, um, there are ways that students with physical disabilities, specifically um, students who are paraplegic, um, they can go through different entrances, but these entrances and, and entrances may be completely far away from their classes. And then lastly, that door is, may not be fully wide enough for students who 
uh, maybe on scooters for uh, sc uh, scooters after a broken leg or uh, students within wheelchairs, students in wheelchair wheelchairs. Uh, so that's something to think about. Um, the point being is that when it comes to universities or really just higher education, there are a lot of barriers that prevent um, or impede upon students with disabilities learning. Something else that was talked about in your book was fewer job opportunities. Um, now, this isn't to say that there are jobs specifically for people living with disabilities. No. What this is saying, uh, what the book talks about is that there are not a lot of accommodations, uh, a lot of jobs that offer accommodations for people living with disabilities. So really, just to summarize up that point, the system um, of ableism impedes and creates barriers um, that excuse me, um, education, services, and laws, they can create barriers that impede upon the daily living of people living with disabilities. So that's really important to recognize. Your book also talked about an indifference to um, offenders with disabilities. Um, I'll provide you with the link um, after the lecture or within Moodle. Now, this is a topic that really isn't discussed a lot in public um, or it, amongst the public. Um, something that's something that your book talked about is that the DOC, the Department of Corrections, don't really address the needs of inmates with living with disabilities. And typically, the images that we see of people within prisons they're able-bodied, they're walking, um, they're talking, they have sight, they, ha they can hear, um, some to suggest that they are, they are also without a psychological disability or disorder in particular. So when we have these images, we make these assumptions that there's only, that there are able-bodied people within prisons, and that's not true. A lot of, um, there are a lot of people within prisons that are, that live with disabilities and there's not a lot of accommodations or uh, accessibility for these folks. So when you think, think about um, letter writing, so for inmates who, inmates with, um, let's say specific learning disorders related to writing and reading, they may not fully be able to um, write a letter to their loved ones. They may rely on another in, uh, uh, person within prison. Another big part of it, think about the educational programs within um, prisons. Research does suggest that these educational programs um, reduce recidivism rates. So engagement within these programs um, reduce the likelihood of a person reoffending and going back to prison. Now, a lot of these programs do not provide accommodations for uh, people living with disabilities who are also in prison. And that's really important. They don't, they won't be able to engage or fully receive the benefits um, of these education programs. So I'm curious as to how many folks have heard about this concern before. Another big part of ableism um, that your book talked about was hate crimes. Uh, we, have res we have research evidence and anecdotal evidence to suggest that people living with disabilities do experience harassment. Um, and it's typically routine. 
and it's in private and public settings. They may be ridiculed, they may be humiliated, um, they may be attacked. Um, they also may be, um, they may receive microaggressions. And typically the legal enforcement on the laws related to um, hate crimes with disabilities is very, very, very relaxed and it's not enforced if it's rarely enforced. It's something that it, it's not, it appears that it's not being taken seriously. So let me share with y'all the microaggressions. So let's get out of here. Here it is. Okay. Oops. Hold on. Yes, share the screen. No, not that one. Where is it? This one. Here we go. Okay, so sorry about that. Um, so this is the microaggressions um, related to disabilities. So you have different themes here. First one, denial of personal identity. So really what it looks at is that this person's identity um, is ignored beside, and, and really it's, it's where the, the person's disability is seen. So for example, I can't believe you're married. Now, remember when we talked about microaggressions that they can, that they're very um, insidious um, and that they come off as if they, it's a compliment. Uh, this is in no part a compliment at all. Um, so it communicates a certain message such as this. There is no part of your life that is normal or like mine. The only thing when I see you is your disability. That's really, really hurtful and can be humiliating. Um, another one, denial of disability experience. So that's when a person living with a disability's experience are minimized, they're denied. Come on now, we all have some disability. Eh, that's not really nice. Um, it's really just suggesting to that person, the person that receives that microaggression that your experience is not important and it's not real to me. Um, and that can be very, very hurtful. And there are different themes of microaggression. So I'm just gonna scroll down here. So if you just look here, oops, come on. So there's a lot of different themes that are explored when it comes to microaggression, microaggressions um, related to ableism. Another big one, something that I've, com I've commonly heard, um, desexualization. It occurs when sexuality or sexual being is denied. And this is, because this is related to ableism, this is among people living with um, disabilities. The comment, I would never date someone who uses a wheelchair. What it communicates is that that person, a uh, person with disabilities, is not on my level, they're not attractive, and they're not worthy. Uh, so really whenever you look at, um, when you look at these microaggressions, and I'll put these microaggressions on Moodle, um, there's this denial of um, people living with disabilities experience um, and violation of their, of their personal experience. So let's go back to the slides. Okay, so let's see, here's where we were. Another one, 
ableism is apparent in culture. Um, when we look at the standards of beauty, the values of our country and how we communicate, um, we value people who are able-bodied. We value people who uh, live independently, meaning that they don't require accommodations, uh, or they don't prefer uh, accommodations. Um, we also value people who are very smart. We value intelligent people. Another big one, like I mentioned, communication. So within, let's say your major films, there's not a lot of subtitles or, um, or there isn't offerings of um, braille paraphernalia. Um, and I say paraphernalia, I'm talking about like any um, form of paper uh, that has braille on it for, per for persons living with um, blindness. Um, as far as I know, that's not offered in the movie theaters. I or that wasn't offered in the movie theaters that I've been in um, in my life. When we look at the media, like such as movies, news outlets, the communication is based on vision and auditory abilities, and it excludes people um, or persons living with visual or auditory disabilities, and it communicates that this is the norm, um, that vis having vision and having the ability to hear is what should be. So when we look at ableism as a whole, what it communicates to people's, uh, persons living with disabilities is that they are not the norm and that uh, that there's that denial of their experiences. Uh, and in part that comes from the history, it really that's, that's ableism overall. And when we look at the history, we will talk about how um, ableism came about. So, Starting with this historical treatment of people with disabilities, um, what we found is that initially there was this use of religious lens to examine um, disability. Really, it was associated, uh, disabilities were associated with sin and moral um, or immorality, and those who were living with disability. Um, were seen as sinners and immoral or um, were damned uh, or uh, eternally damned, uh, for example. And they were isolated um, within uh, Western culture. Children, li uh, not children, um, infants with um, living with, dis infants with disabilities were um, often placed on doorsteps, they were abandoned, or they were dropped from rooftops, they were killed. Um, children living with disabilities were also abandoned and placed on the street um, and where they had to beg for money. Uh, also, adults living with um, disabilities were placed in mental asylums or um, prisons and they were confined to inhumane treatment. The term handicapped uh, within English history um, came about when you had children with disabilities using the cap of their hand to um, get money when they were asking on the street. And as time went on and what we have documented within English and US history, US American history, excuse me, is that there was this continual inhumane treatment of people living with disabilities. Now, at the same time, there was these rise in um, freak shows. People, with living, people living with disabilities at that point in time were not seen as human. They were seen as quote unquote freaks or less than. And they were also uh, used 
are they were employed by entertainment um, entertainment folks and they were part of the quote unquote freak shows. So the audience um, displayed this fascination with uh, this fascination of people living with disabilities and on the flip side would also berate them, call them freaks. Now granted, this is not the ideal situation. However, people living with disabilities saw that as steady income. They were able to get food. They were able to survive, right? Um, now, as time went on, and this was within the 18th um, century, uh, what was going on was that there was a lot of influence from the scientific and medical field. And what ended up happening was that this, that the medical field were in, was influencing parts of everyday life. And what you saw was a medicalization of daily life. Um, and with that, you also saw the medicalization of disabilities, of sickness. Further with that, doctors were looking towards people um, with disabilities and saying that I can fix you, that there's a cure for these disabilities. And typically what ended up happening was that um, people living with disabilities, they experienced invasive treatments. They experienced um, some harsh forms of medi some medications with some harsh side effects. And lastly, it created this, this, this influence created this, um, this perception that people living with disabilities are to be cured and that they are to be monitored and controlled. And a lot of the times you had doctors making decisions for people living with disabilities. As time went on, the language um, was stigmatizing for people with disabilities. Um, the term mentally retarded was used quite frequently and also very stigmatizing. Um, medical imbecility, for example. Uh, and those terms were associated with people with, um, people with intellectual disabilities and um, of note, um, people who spoke two different languages. They were considered to be um, quote unquote mentally retarded. Now that, and I don't know if that's you know, stigmatizing enough for you, there was also this rise in eugenics. In, uh, eugenics. So remember we talked about Sir Francis Galton, who was Darwin's, um, Charles Darwin's cousin. He coined the term eugenics. Um, and with this term, there were a lot of scientists who endorsed um, eugenics, eugenics, um, excuse me, eugenics, and further promoted the sterilization of people with disabilities. So let's pause for a moment. When we look at the historical treatment of people with disabilities, it went from this conception of faith, suggesting that they were immoral, to this medical, um, to this medical lens or hyper medical lens, if you if you will, and people with disabilities were subjected to treatments, um, and they were seen as um, subjects to be cured and to be monitored. So when we look at the historical treatment as a whole, you have people who were living with no disabilities, making decisions um, and treating people with disabilities as if they were, as if they had no idea of what was best for them. Um, so it was very paternalistic. And what we started seeing post-World War II was this shift. Um, so you had veterans who um, who were severely injured in the war, they may have become paraplegic, they may have, um, they may have lost a limb in the war. And so you had doctors shifting their focus from um, control to rehabilitation. 
Now, granted, this was a positive shift forward. There were still a lot of decisions that were made on behalf of people with disabilities. You had doctors making um, decisions for people living with disabilities. And within the 1960s and 1970s, you had the independent living movement come about. And this was at the, towards, a little bit towards the ends of the civil rights movement. Um, and with this movement, it was in response of the medicalization of disability. Um, so what it challenged was paternalistic, um, paternalistic behaviors of medical doctors saying, I know what's best for you um, within the same movement, the environment, uh, excuse me, the environment was seen as problematic and it shifted that blame from the person to the environment. And then lastly, it encouraged people living with disabilities to make their own personal decisions uh, instead of the doctor. So taken as a whole, the independent living movement um, was a very um, important movement within the United States American history, um, one that is typically not discussed. Uh, and really what it, it did was bring attention to the ways in which, um, number one, the, the over or the the extreme influence of um, the medical field within their within the lives of people with disabilities, um, also shifting that attention from the individual to the environment, the ways in which the environment creates barriers that impede upon the daily living of people with disabilities, and then lastly to encourage people with disabilities to make their own decisions and really just to empower them. So as a result of this movement, you saw a lot of legal, uh, a, a lot of policies come out in place. Um, now, to be quite clear, I mentioned that while these laws have been put in place, we still have a lot of ways to go. Um, there still are some limitations uh, related to these laws that still impede the daily lives of people with disabilities. Um, and that's something to make note of. While there have been strides that have been made, there's still more progress to be made as well. Now, the discourse um, within politics, within healthcare and education around disabilities has not always been so positive to be quite frank. So within politics, um, if you've seen this image before, this is in reference to um, President Trump making, uh, uh, telling a story about a reporter living with a disability. And as he's telling the story, um, he engages in what the media have called um, mocking behaviors. And to be quite frank, it did appear to be mocking. I will be frank about that. Um, and I've provided the link in case you wanted to um, view what I'm talking about. Really within politics, the discourse around um, disability and people with disabilities has, first off, it hasn't been taken seriously. Second, it's really, really negative. Um, and a lot of the policies that are made do not focus, are not made around the interest of people living with disabilities. So with that, that's also impacted the healthcare, uh, uh, really the healthcare laws. And something to make note, because the discourse of um, the discourse within politics around disabilities and people with disabilities is so lax and not as positive, the laws around uh, disabilities or around the interests of people with disabilities are also affected. 
and at a disproportionate level. So when we look at the American Care Act, uh, the American Care Act, the Affordable Care Act, um, there was a lot of concerns specifically related to the costs and losses of coverage for people living with disabilities. Um, the American Health Care Act, the AHCA, there was a lot of drastic reductions to Medicaid. Um, and within that, there was a lot of eliminations of services for people living with disabilities. So with the health care acts that have been passed, um, they've been formed in the economic interest, not the interest of, um, really not the interest of health. And that's what your book, which your, that's what your book suggests. Uh, the discourse around health care has always been about what can be most affordable for the average American. Well, if you think about it, um, the if you really look more into it, um, this discourse is what disproportionate, uh, disproportionately impacts people living with disabilities. And then lastly, within higher education. Um, so I outlined lack of access and accommodation. Uh, so something that we know from research is that um, higher educational attainment so the more education that an individual attains, um, the more likely they are to make more money. Now that's a correlation. Correlation is not causation. If you've been through Psych 102, you, you will always hear, you've heard that term many, many times. And as you progress in your, his, in your career of psychology, if you, are, if you do, you will continuously hear correlation is not causation. Um, if you're not in psychology, there you go. That is something that we discuss quite a bit. Correlation is not causation. Um, however, what we do see and what we do notice is that people living with disabilities, um, there is a report of lower educational attainment. Now, that's not to say that people living with disabilities are not going to college um, because they don't want to. Uh, no what we have seen is that because there's a lack of access and accommodation that that's a hindrance to um, the education for students living with disabilities and that it makes it harder. Another one, there's a lack of research on universal design principles. Um, so when we look at the structures of buildings, there's really it's more accommodating to people live people not living with um, disabilities. So one thing that we could do to address that is research. However, there's not a lot of research on designs that accommodate everyone, um, mainly people living with disabilities. And then lastly, there's not a lot of research on the experiences of students with disabilities. When we discuss ableism in research, um, it's typically about the construct, ableism itself, um, other people's experiences uh, with their privilege related to ableism, and not so much students with, um, with, those, with specific disabilities are just students with disabilities at all. And that can create a problem. What I'm getting at, or what I'm saying the problem is, if we're not outlining the ways that students with disabilities are experiencing their experience, there isn't a way to address it. It's not documented. And if it's not documented, it can't be addressed. So. Something to keep in mind is a lot of the times when we talk about these oppressions, and to be quite clear, to be quite frank, the voice that you typically hear are people who are, who are privileged. And in the case of ableism, who you hear talking is people or who you who people who typically are doing the doing a lot of the talking are people with that privilege. Um, 
and while they rec- and while those who recognize their privilege that's that's really great i think it also can be great to include people living with disabilities to discuss their experiences within higher education and at their own um, at their own will at, on their own personal choice um, what you don't want to do is just take somebody and say hey you're gonna talk for everyone with a disability that's not appropriate <laughs> um, to be quite frank um, it's not appropriate at all so while we've looked at ableism just as a singular system, it's important to recognize the ways in which it can occur at the intersections of our identities. So what we find is that there's an overlap of oppression. So let's take, for example, a male veteran with PTSD and a female identified, uh, a woman identified, excuse me, um, rape survivor with PTSD. So the treatment um, that a male veteran would receive, um, it would be taken a lot more seriously than a woman who experiences, who experienced and survived rape and is currently experiencing PTSD symptomology. Um, when you look at the discourse around sexual assault um, and rape in particular, it there's this blaming of women, right, for their experiences. And then also, they're also experiencing um, these symptoms related to PTSD. And typically what society are, typically what society tells women when they're experiencing things like that is, it's, it's nothing, you're fine. Um, when in actuality, they are very well experiencing these symptoms. Another one that is typically talked about is racism, is the intersection of racism and ableism. Um, your book talks about research that suggests that there's an overrepresentation of students of color in special education courses. Now, it begs the question of, is it that there are children of color with um, specific learning disorders, um, intellectual disabilities, uh, or, is there, is there racial bias um, within assessments? Now, the thing about that, the thing about this is that it could be a little of both. It could be one more than the other. The thing is, we don't know until more research comes out about it. Um, that's just something that's typically observed. And it's important to recognize the ways in which racial bias can play a role in, um, assessments for children uh, in particular are uh, specifically related to um, learning disorders or externalizing disorders such as ADHD. So what has psychology done um, to be ableist? Um, quite a bit. So let's start with drapedomania. Um, Drapedomania was formulated by, it was coined by Samuel L. Cartwright. This, this term was formed at the time of uh, uh, where, where slavery was still legal within the United States. And it was, it was considered to be a fear uh, or intent, not fear, excuse me, um, an intense drive, an intense need to run away from the plantation. And this is really in reference to African slaves. Um, so what it came out of this perspective that um, slave owners were treating their slaves really, really nicely. They were fed good food, they were housed. Um, and what we have known is that these living conditions were not great, um, to be quite frank, and there's a lot of historical evidence for that um, and docu uh, documentation. And Samuel Cartwright came up with this, this disorder suggesting that slaves who wanted to run away were, um, had disordered thinking. And as a result, the treatment was um, to be beaten. 
another one, hysteria. Hysteria was typically applied to women. Um, the symptoms were anxiety-related sy symptoms, depressive-related symptoms. Uh, excuse me. So with, with women in the earlier years, in the early history of U.S. America and in English history, women did not have a lot of rights. Um, they were told what to do on a daily basis. Um, they, didn't, they did not have the right to vote on land, so forth and so on. So women who were experiencing these symptoms um, were considered crazy, uh, to be quite frank, and that the treatment was um, sexual stimulation for women. Other times it was beatings. And then lastly, and something that psychology is most notorious for, um, the categorization of homosexuality as a disorder. Um, now to be quite clear and to be very explicit, um, homosexuality is not a disorder. Um, the, the sexual attraction feelings um, and romantic feelings for someone of the same gender, um, that, is not a, that is not a disorder in and of itself. It just means you are attracted to a certain somebody. It just means you're attracted to someone of the same gender. That's all it means. It doesn't mean you're, it doesn't mean that um, a person is disordered. Now, at the time, whenever this was considered a, uh, whenever this was considered a disorder, um, people, people who were quote unquote diagnosed um, were subjected to very harsh treatment, um, such as conversion therapy, uh, electroconvulsive therapy, uh, so, or excuse me, shock therapy. Uh, so to be quite clear, at that point in time, psychology considered um, that as a form, as a disorder, and that was completely incorrect. If you think about it, with all of these disorders, there was stigmas related to these, um, related to people of these marginalized groups. And we have research that documented that. So psychology, so all this to say, psychology has had a role in ableism. So allyship. So we've talked about what ableism is, what it encompasses, um, the discourse around ableism. Now we're gonna talk about allyship and what that means. So when it comes to being an ally, uh, there are those who declare themselves as allies before um, members of that group say that they are. And a lot of times those who have identified themselves as allies, they may be doing things that aren't really helping that group. So what we're gonna talk about is being aware of your language as well as your communication style. So the first one, the use of affirmative language and the decrease, what we don't wanna do, um, which is use of negative language. So we wanna use person first language. So within the lecture, you've heard me say, people with disabilities, people living with disabilities, that's affirmative language. Uh, in essence, it puts the person before that, um, before the disability, person first. It's affirming. Negative language would be using that, uh, that label as an adjective for that person. So for example, disabled person, um, another one mentally retarded person, intellectually disabled persons. Uh, so that's not person first language. 
Instead, you're suggesting that something happened to that person. So being aware of your language is really important, especially when it comes to a, being an ally um, for this group. Another one, communication. So within the media and TV, in TV shows, when there has been encounters of people with disabilities, um, it may be a person uh, who experienced a stroke, it may be a person with uh, living with intellectual disability. Typically what you see in the media is someone talking to them as if they're babies. Um, and if you ask me, that's kind of annoying. Instead, speak directly and in a regular tone. Talk to that person as if they were a person. Um, don't infant uh, don't do baby language, don't speak slow. If you think about it, that's really insulting to that person because it communicates that that person, it communicates to that person that they are not able to um, understand you uh, and that you have to treat them as if they are different. Um, using descriptive language is really important as well, particularly for persons living with blindness. It's important to direct, um, mention direction and size when you're communicating. If a person living with blindness asks you where the, where the garbage can is, to say over there, you're not being, first off, you're not being a nice human. Second, you're not being descriptive enough. Um, what does over there mean? Being vague. So be, be descriptive, give details. And then lastly, um, identify yourself. Don't just go up to a person, persons living with blindness or persons um, with, persons with deafness um, and just uh, pop up. Um, because first off, that's, that's weird. And second, it's important to just allow them to get, it's important to give space for a person to want to talk to you. Um, because if you're just simply ass assuming that they're going to talk to you, that's that's part of that privilege, that there's that assumption. Um, and then lastly, you could make a, in identifying yourself and having conversations, you can't, you may make a friend. So, oops. So we talked a lot about ableism. Uh, we looked at some of the microaggressions. We looked at what um, encompasses ableism, as well as the historical treatment, as well as allyship. So if you have any questions about this lecture, please feel free to um, email me and I will do my best to expand upon the concepts. In the next video, I will talk about um, youth and elder oppression.